Okay, so today we're going to be building an RB26 bottom end. Uh, we're going to be doing a PRP uh, brace. Um, this engine has a set of CP pistons and manly rods, as well as ACL bearings, mains, and rods. Uh, we're going to be doing an N1 pump with a set of Rimax billet gears, and uh, we're going to do a bit of a step-by-step -step on how we assemble these types of engines, what our margin of error is, and uh, the types of things we look for when we're building this sort of package. Um, some things to note about that, uh, when we're building the engine, we're obviously not going to run into every sort of problem that you could run into while assembling your engine. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, everything here will probably go a little bit more smooth than when you're doing it. You might run into an issue with the tool or some machine work or something like that. So always keep that in mind. Uh, some things to note when you're starting off. Um, you always want to make sure all your parts for the engine are a nominal um, temperature. You want to have room temperature if possible. A little bit warmer is always better, but make sure the parts that you're going to be assembling are all in the same area and they're all the same temperature. Um, if you keep your pistons in the freezer and your block in the, in the sauna, it's going to have different dimensions when you go to measure it because one has shrunk and one has expanded. So you obviously want to make sure that's a little bit of an extreme. But you want to make sure that your engine is not in a cold room and your pistons are not in a hot room and vice versa because when you go to measure them together, um, each component will be a different size from what you expect to see. So one of our first primary tools that we're going to be using when assembling this engine, uh, we have four different sizes of of Mitutoyo um, digital micrometers. So these micrometers go down to a hundred thousandths of an inch, um, which is five decimal places past the decimal point. Um, it only does half a hundred thousandths, so it's not uh, a single decimal point. Um, you may or may not have access to this level of tooling. Um, you're probably more likely to have a, a micrometer that only has these measurements here. Um, we use this as a double verification. We always reference the digital and then go back and reference this. Um, the advantage of these uh, micrometers is you're almost guaranteed to find any sort of machining error that could arise or was overlooked when you had your engine machined. Um, our margin of error for when we assemble engines is uh, two ten thousandths of an inch. Um, anything more than that, we see if there's an issue and if we need to make adjustments or if the application will live in that uh, margin of error or not. Um, we decide based on the application. But generally, our margin of error allowable limit is two ten thousandths of an inch, um, and that sets us up for a good success with any engine build we, we have. So the next tool you're going to want to have uh, when assembling your engine is a bore gauge. Um, we have two different sizes of bore gauge. Um, this one primarily is used for cylinder bore, um, main bore, and rod big end. Um, the other one that we're going to use um, for smaller measurements, uh, this one is pretty much for under one inch to an inch and a half. Um, this one is used for piston pin bore. Uh, mostly, almost primarily for that, um, and then any other tighter tolerances that we need to measure um, under one inch. Uh, next up, uh, when you're working with aftermarket rods, um, mostly ARP hardware, you're always going to want to have a stretch gauge um, to measure the rod bolt length um, to get that maximum torque onto the rod. Um, alternatively, people usually run just a torque wrench onto the, onto the rod bolt and you don't know if you're 100% at the limit of the bolt um, as far as the manufacturer would recommend. Um, so we always use these. Um, we'll obviously touch on this as we're doing it on the engine and uh, you'll see a little bit more on this. Uh, next you're gonna, probably going to want to have a couple of uh, high quality torque wrenches. Um, these are both digital. They're both digital and they are recalibrated on a regular basis. Um, always make sure your batteries are fully charged um, when using something like this to uh, limit uh, um, errors you might have. Next up, you're probably going to want to have a set of feeler blades. Don't forget about that. Um, you'll see where we use those later on. And then a straight edge, checking the cylinder head flatness, um, also the block flatness on the top. And then uh, last but not least, you're going to want to have a torque plate. Uh, I always recommend having a torque plate when you're assembling any engine uh, with a closed deck. Um, the uh, torque from the head studs and the main studs um, manipulates the block enough to make the measurements different when you go and you measure your um, cylinder bore for piston to wall clearance or your main journal uh, out of round or taper. Um, the main studs will pull the main, main line out of round um, and vice versa. The rod, uh, the main bolts will pull the cylinders out of round as well. So you're always going to want to have your torque plate on as well as the uh, girdle attached to the block and anything else that has high torque and will distress the block out of shape. When the block is machined, these things are also installed um, into the position um, that it'll be living in, exactly when the head's installed and when the main cap is installed um, and machined in that position. So you want to replicate that with uh, these two components here. Uh, so a couple of things that we uh, we have that uh, for specialty tools at least. Um, this is a ring push tool. Um, we don't use this on many engines that uh, obviously we try to measure ring gap with the torque plate installed. Um, so this is designed to sit on top of the deck surface and get the ring square. 
Um, obviously when you have the torque plate installed, you can't get down to the deck surface. Um, so instead we just use an old piston. Piston pushes the ring down, gets it square in the bore. You take a look, make sure it's square. We'll touch on this again when we get to that point. So along with the torque plate, you're always gonna wanna use the hardware that you're gonna be using to assemble the engine. Um, I go as far as making sure the position that the hardware is installed in goes back in the same spot. So if this head stud is measured in this position, that head stud goes back in the same position. As well as your main studs, you always want to use the same main studs you're going to be using when you actually assemble the engine. Um, it just keeps them consistent. You know exactly what you're getting um, when you go to assemble it later on. Next up, we have the uh, cylinder or the engine block brushes. Uh, we have three different sizes here, um, depending on the size of the oil gallery hole. Um, this will probably be the first thing we touch on when we go to assemble. So uh, we'll be more on that soon. So one of the last things that uh, we have here, um, our engine blueprint sheet. Uh, we'll probably make this available on our website, so if you're going to go ahead and you're going to measure um, your engine, um, you can go ahead and you can record your information on the sheet without having to make your own. Um, and then you have the documentation for if you ever sell the engine or if you pass it along to a friend, um, or if you ever need to reference it when you're tuning. Um, oil clearances have a, uh, uh, a great effect on the type of oil you select, so it always helps to have a record and you don't have to remember. So along with your torque plate, you're always going to want to have a spare head gasket. This can be a used head gasket if you want. You're basically just trying to replicate the position of the head gasket on the block um, so you're not damaging the deck surface with any debris that might be there. So you're always going to want to have a head gasket of some kind below the um, torque plate and uh, between the block and the torque plate. First steps on your Arbor 26 engine build, uh, you always want to make sure that it's clean. Um, cleanliness is probably the most important thing. Um, People think, oh, hey, like I'm cleaning out the dust. You're not cleaning out dust, you're cleaning out any machine work that uh, may be left behind, any pieces of steel um, from the overbore, or even from their machine that they clean it in. Um, if they hot tank the block or whatever and they jet wash it, um, material from their previous wash can always enter into this block here. So even if you didn't overbore or do any machine work, you always wanna make sure you get the metal out of the block. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, we remove the oil gallery plugs, so you can see here, we remove the factory oil gallery plug and we tap for a one quarter MPT. Um, this is so we can visibly see that the main line is clean um, when we're cleaning it at a point like this. So this one here is removed. This one here is also removed and tapped. And then on some RB26, 25, 20s, there is also a plug in here. On this application, um, this is going to have a Tarx uh, oil filter sandwich plate. Um, so we're gonna be relocating the filter away from this location. When you're doing that, you actually have to drill this hole out um, another thing to note, some RBs have this hole drilled and plugged. This one just has it machined partially and you have to drill the hole out. Because this is going here now, um, you're removing the factory oil cooler that's there. The factory oil cooler actually has this bypass valve inside of it from factory. Um, so if you go ahead and remove that, you're no longer going to have your oil bypass valve, um, which will, I guess, reduce the oil flow at high end. Um, the RB oil filter does not have a bypass inside inside of it, like some oil filters do. So you will have to install this or you will get extremely high oil pressure, readings at least, and you'll get extremely low oil pressure inside the actual main line. So we're gonna go ahead later on in the video, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna punch this in there, just like that. And that'll be our uh, new oil pressure relief valve. A couple other plugs that you're going to want to remove. Um, this does happen to be a brand new RB26 block. Uh, we did have to remove some brand new plugs, um, but this plug here obviously is going to be your oil feed hole. Um, from factory there's typically a restrictor in there. Um, I think it's around 1.8 or 2 mil. Uh, we remove that and then back here there's also a uh, plug. All RBs have this hole here. It's usually plugged on the uh, RB26 and RB25 Neo. On the Series 1 and Series 2 RB25, it is also another restrictor. Um, and that's just because the VCD head has a hydraulic um, lifter, so it requires more oil flow. Um, so we'll go ahead, we'll, we'll touch on this later on, but uh, for cleaning purposes, you're gonna want those plugs removed as well as the two on the side. Um, we do also carry uh, the OEM replacement plugs for this location on the front here. Um, so you don't need to tap it. This just makes it easy to service in the future. All right, so for cleanliness, um, you're pretty much going to want to go through and you're going to want to pass your brushes through um, each oil gallery just to loosen up anything that might be stuck to the side that will loosen up with oil flow. Um, so first off, we're just going to run the brushes through it. So you're going to want to run your uh, brush across the long way. Um, check each one of these here as well. When you don't remove these plugs, this is where the primary amount of debris will be. Um, these ones, when the block is upside down, you're doing your machine work on the bottom or whatever, falls into these holes, dries, solidifies, gets stuck. You run the engine, um, the debris falls down, 
runs right to the back of the block and then into the rear main bearing. Um, that's the most common issue we see uh, with machine work issues or machine work cleanliness issues. Um, there's also one oil gallery hole that runs from this side of the block to the oil feed hole. Okay, once you have those ones all clean, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna flip the block over. All right, now they have the block upside down. Go ahead and take a look inside the block here. You're gonna have seven oil gallery feed holes uh, into your main bearings. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna run our brush through each one of those. I can go ahead and you can do it a couple of times. There's another couple areas you're gonna to wanna to clean out here. Um, this is the oil pump feed hole. This goes from the strainer into the oil pump. Um, this one's easy to clean. It's really short it's from here to here. Run your brush through. And then the other one here on the other side, this is the oil pump feed to the oil filter housing. It runs straight along the side here. So once you run your brushes through everything here, uh, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna run some compressed air um, through all the oil galleries um, just to make sure, and then we're gonna do a visual inspection. Okay, so we're just gonna be uh, blowing compressed air through the block. Um, I do recommend air protection and eye protection for this situation. The metal and the airflow makes a large screeching noise. At some points, it can be uncomfortable. So I recommend you repeat this process three or four times before you move on to doing the final wipe down. Um, we will be doing a couple extra steps when we go to install the main bearings. Um, we're gonna clean the surface up with some Scotch-Brite and then we'll be re-cleaning again. Um, pretty much for right now, we're gonna be cleaning um, to uh, verify the machine works. We're gonna clean the block. We're gonna install our main cap, uh, our torque plate, and our brace. And then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna verify all the machine work we had done. Um, we'll talk more about that soon. Uh, we can go ahead now, we're going to visually inspect uh, the main line um, and then each individual oil hole. Okay, when you have the light inside the hole on the side, you can also go down. You're going to be looking in a couple of places. Uh, so once you get the light on there, you're going to look into each one of these main journal holes. Each one of these across here. Make sure there's no debris in there. And then you're going to want to check inside of each oil jet hole as well. All the way across. Uh, with the light shining, you can only see about halfway. Um, so you want to head and move the light on the other side and then continue checking. Also one other area you have to check across here, just down across into the oil gallery hole here. This is a new block, um, so we don't have a lot of issues in this area, but on a used block sometimes you get solidified oil in between there and uh, you will have to work it out. Um, that is also another area where machine metal likes to get caught, um, often overlooked. Um, that metal um, can go right to your turbos and damage your turbo or turbos. Uh, one area uh, on a older RB26 block, 25, 20. This hole is drilled, this boss here is drilled for a 1 8 BSPT plug. Uh, we'll usually shine a light in here and get a good uh, sight line on this plug up top here. But uh, for now, we're just gonna flip the engine over and then we're gonna shine it in from the side and take a look from the top. Okay, so we're gonna be shining our light in from the front or the back, depending on where you're looking. Um, then we're gonna be taking a look down inside of this hole here. Might be hard to see on camera, but there's a little bit of light shining through there and you can kind of see if you have any debris stuck to the sides. Okay, so now that you've got your uh, block cleaned out, uh, you ran your brushes through it, you've blown compressed air through it, uh, we do a kind of a, another wipe down of the whole block, uh, mostly the machine surfaces. Uh, we use 99% uh, isopropyl alcohol. Um, there is 1% water in there, so you always wanna make sure when you're wiping things clean like this um, that you don't let it sit for too long. You re-oil it if you do let it sit. Sometimes people use 70% isopropyl alcohol. Um, this stuff's good because it doesn't leave a residue behind when you're wiping. Whereas on, if uh, you use a brake clean or, or another type of solvent, um, it could leave residue on the surface here, um, which is not ideal for measurements, first of all. Um, and you don't wanna have anything between um, a new machine surface and the component that's supposed to be breaking in when the engine starts up. We also like to use uh, microfiber cloth so we don't leave too much debris behind um, while you're wiping down. If you use paper towel, it'll get caught on the ridges of the, the cylinder bore here. Um, it'll get caught on top of the head gasket uh, or on top of the block surface here as well and leave little fuzzies behind. Um, so you want to kind of keep it as clean as possible um, using the least, I guess, uh, lint-ridden cloth you can find. I do recommend the microfiber. So we're just going to start by cleaning the cylinder walls. Uh, you want to remove any sort of solvent that is there from the machine work. Um, you can kind of see the witness marks um, from the solvent and uh, the, machine, the machining cleaning um, in the top of the deck here. So that's going to be also on the cylinder walls. So we'll start with the cylinder walls first. We'll move on to the deck and then we'll do the cylinder walls again. 
All right, so now that you've cleaned your cylinder bores, uh, your deck surface, we'll flip it over. We're gonna clean the main line um, and all the areas in there as well. All right, so in this area here on the main line, um, these areas are critical um, for measuring as well as having a good bearing surface uh, mate. Um, so it transfers heat, transfers the load, um, and you don't end up with any sort of debris stuck behind the bearing that'll pretty much limit its ability to transfer the heat or to transfer the load. Um, so once we get it back from machining, I always like to go ahead and use a little bit of red Scotch-Brite. Just scuff the surface lightly, make sure that you're removing any sort of possible debris or um, uh, any solvent that could be on the surface that's limiting its ability to transfer the heat back into the block. You're just going to want to make a couple passes. Uh, you don't want to do anything too crazy. You're just trying to remove any sort of leftover debris or high spots that might still be on there um, from solvent. You can also go ahead and you can just quickly run a swipe across the tops here where the uh, main girdle or main cap will be mounting. Again, these areas are critical. Uh, if you get any sort of debris in this area here, it'll affect your, your bearing clearances. Um, It'll also affect the measurement that you're seeing. You could end up with a uh, broken cap. Um, you can end up with a, a, a measurement in here that doesn't make sense. So I like to do this step in between one of my three cleaning processes, um, just so I know that I'm getting a good clean surface. Um, so next I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna wipe down each journal, and then we'll run the brushes through again and compressed air, and then we'll do our final clean. So just down in here, when you're cleaning out uh, or you're wiping off the uh, journals here, you can already see it looks a little bit more smooth and consistent surface here. Um, one thing you want to notice or you're going to want to clean out uh, after you um, scotch bright is just in this journal here, this little um, groove in here. Um, debris always sticks in there, so you're going to want to get your rag in there and clean that out. All right, so now that you've got your uh, mainline journals cleaned up, uh, we'll go ahead, we'll run the air compressed, uh, the compressed air through again and the brushes. Um, one area, now that we're pretty much done, down to our last bits of cleaning, you're going to want to make sure inside of each main journal cap hole, here, 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 you're going to want to make sure there's no debris in there so when you go to install the studs, um, there's no interference when you're going to install them. So compressed air through each one of these holes. Um, and then same on the head stud side. All right, so now that we're going to clean the block, um, we're going to go ahead, we're going to cover it up, we're going to move on to the girdle and the, the brace. Uh, we'll do a bit of cleaning on that as well. Um, if at any point during the process um, you find buildup of metal anywhere else, or even if you don't feel comfortable that you cleaned it good enough, just do it again. Um, it doesn't hurt to be too clean. Um, you want to be able to pretty much eat off it. Um, just guarantee success. It's simple, simple steps to ensure that uh, the longevity of the engine is what you want it to be. Um, don't skip a step. Don't, don't skip a step when cleaning. Um, you want to do it three, four times. Um, make sure you get it done um, properly. Otherwise, you could miss something, and uh, it'll cost you.